there and welcome back. This is Matt Holon with Granberry Volunteer Fire Department. The class that we're going to be covering today is specifically for the Emergency Response Guidebook or the ERG. And this purpose of this class is to complement our hazmat and awareness class and ultimately leading to state certification. But more importantly, this is just a practical use of the book. At the end of the day, hazmats are something that can really bite you in the tail, and you need to be exceedingly careful when you're on scenes with them, and that is the purpose of this book, is to be a catch-all to help you learn what to do quickly on scene, because you've got multiple factors that you have to take into consideration when you're first on scene, and you're Officers, your chiefs, your mutual aid may take a little while to get there to help you actually establish that scene. And the purpose of this book is to help give you kind of like the leg up and a solid start coming out of the gate. So we're going to just kind of go in brief detail, section by section of this book. But the big thing I want you to realize is, is that watching this class and not having the book in front of you, or if you end up using your phone or an app uh, on the iPad or whatever tablet you have, your computer, it's kind of pointless. So if you don't have that, you either need to download the ERG book into your phone or tablet or having one with you. Uh, with that said, we're going to start with literally the date. These books are issued every four years, so obviously this is from 2020. The next revision will come out in 2020. The easiest way to start with this book is literally starting at the very front page. How to use this guidebook. It gives you a detailed explanation of how to read the book and also how to read the shipping papers. And I'm, again, I'm not going to break this all down. You should have that, that the book or documents in front of you so that you can actually use them quicker. This is just to help highlight some of the areas and how to actually use the, practically the book. So the first thing I'm going to do is jump to page 8. We've got a table of contents. But we're going to shoot over to page 8. And I want to start right here because this is a good place to begin because it's a table of markings, labels, and placards that are common on all of our shipping containers, drums, barrels, trucks, rail. Anything that's moving down the road can have a placard on this if, it, if it's got a hazmat association. And the thing I want you to realize is, is that they have different items grouped. Okay, And I'm not going to go into all the breakdown of the signs because that's the purpose of the hazmat class. But the one thing I really want to highlight are these black circles with white letters. That gives you the guide number for all those corresponding sections. And it tells you what guide to jump to. So you can jump up if you don't have a particular UN identification number at the bottom of that placard. You can, If it's a blue sign with that black flame in it, you can jump to guide number 139. You'll see the same thing when you jump into other sections where, like this particular section is the rail car section. The purpose of the rail car section is to help you identify the different types of rail cars that you might be seeing going down the lines. But it also gives you the opportunity, even if you're not sure if you can get close enough to find the placard, you can just sit there and reference the physical rail car shape and figure and use that to help you identify where to start from a guide number. You'll see the same thing for over the road truck and trailer. Same thing, the guide numbers are there and it gives you a basic breakdown of the size and the PSIs associated with each and every one of those trailers. As we keep going, we've got another smaller truck and intermodal freight container again. I want to highlight guide number 111 real quick. In the event that you can't find a marking, but something's leaking and you're not 100% sure if it's a hazmat, don't run up and lick it or taste it, but you need to maybe isolate the area, guide 111 is your catch-all for everything. It's your unknown containers, it's unknown markings, unknown contents. Guide 111 is, is the golden junior woodchuck catch-all. 
Jumping over to page 16, this page specifically references individual packaging or drums. And so it's the proverbial semi or Penske truck going down the road and you have a whole bunch of boxes laying out with different labels. And all these different labels just tell you what's the general contents of each one of those packages. It's just more of the front section for the white pages. Jumping in here, this is, this is an important page. I'm going to cover it in a little more detail. It's the hazardous identification numbers displayed on some intermodal containers. Intermodal containers are sea land containers typically associated with cargo ships. The ship makes port. It gets moved to a train. Train takes it across country. And then from the trains, it gets broke down, put on the semis. And from the semis, it's delivered. And one of the things that's real common with these containers is this orange placard with a black outline in letter or numbers. And the 33 and the 1203, those numbers can change, but the, the, the grouping of those numbers can mean something. So we jump down here. This explains to you what all these different numbers that can be up top. And when you find that you're using particularly this book in all capacities, you need to make sure that you read the notes section and read everything exactly in order. Do not jump. Do not skip. Take the 30 seconds to read everything. I want to highlight here that the doubling of a digit indicates an in intensification of the particular hazard. So in this case, 33 is extra bad. What is it? flammability of liquids, gases, or self-heating liquids. So whatever it is, it's extra bad. Okay, They want to bring that to point. The next thing I want to highlight here is where the hazards associated with the substance can be adequately indicated with a single digit and the digits followed by a zero. So it could be 30. So they're just saying that one thing is flammability of liquids. The other part I want to add to that is when you jump on this other page, you start having the hazard identification numbers have the following meanings. So they have different meanings. And you'll start to realize that these corresponding numbers start to stack into other things. So it can be a flammable liquid, and it can be an oxidizing agent, and it can be potentially a risk of spontaneous violent reaction. So you can have these different setups identified in that top number. This bottom number, that's the UN identification number. And we'll talk about that in a second. The other thing I want to highlight is specifically an X. When there's an X in front of that number, it means that it reacts violently or dangerously with water. So if you ever, th this number up here is real important and that X there even tells you more about it. I'm going to keep going. Just some more of the actual different types of container markings that you can see out there. Bouncing into the next section is the pipelines. I'm not going to go into pipelines real, real in depth. This is page 22. We have classes specifically dedicated to pipeline emergencies. And that in itself is its own thing. But they've got a basic outline on how to handle a pipeline emergency. As we continue to go ahead, we finally get to the main point for our ERG. That white section is strictly there to help you for reference and quick uh, checking on how, are you looking something up right. It is the Junior Woodchuck How to Use This Book guidebook. Now the main part of this book gets to these colored pages. And you'll notice we have yellow, blue, orange, green. And we'll go into detail on each one of those sections. The yellow section literally starts with the introduction to the yellow pages. And it, again, this is important to actually follow the instructions clearly here. For entries highlighted in green, follow the following steps. If there is no fire, go to directly to table one. We'll talk about table one in a second. If a fire is involved, use the appropriate orange guide for evacuation. So it's real important to understand that if there is no fire or if there is fire, 
out of the gate, they're going to have you use this differently. You're going to either go immediately to the green section, which is back here, or you're going to go to the orange section. The next thing to make note with all of this is paying attention, particularly if table one's involved, which is the green pages, that when a spill is in water, these materials produce produce large amounts of toxic inhalation hazards, TIH, okay? Real important to pay attention to the, to the flow of how this book's intended to work. So I'm going to go into physically using the yellow pages now. You've arrived on scene. You've seen a placard on an apparatus, one of these placards, and on the bottom part of that placard, down here, it has a four-digit number, and in this particular case, we're going to say that pretend that it's 1001, okay? Up here at the top, ID number 1001, guide number 116, and the name of the material, okay? And it'll give you where to go from there. So in this case, 1001 is a guide number of 116. And you would immediately jump over to guide 116. Now I'm going to jump immediately into the blue pages. Same thing, it tells you how to use the blue pages. If there is no fire, go directly to table 1 if there's a green border. If there is a fire, go to the orange pages. Now if you remember, our ID number was 1011. And here we are. We've got the same thing, 1011, guide number 116. But let's pretend that you couldn't find the actual guide number, but you found a shipping paper that gave you the name of the chemical. And in this case, it's acetylene, and it's dissolved. Okay, So the blue pages are there to help you find a ID number and a guide number by the name. The yellow pages are there to help you find the guide number and a name and give you a reference to use either the yellow or blue pages to figure out ultimately how to end up in the guide pages or the orange pages. So when you first show up on scene, you get the name of the product or the guide number, the correction, the ID number of the product. You reference the yellow or blue pages and ultimately use that to go to the, the orange pages, the guide pages. Once we're in the orange pages, it is very specific to make sure that you follow each and every step associated with it. Don't leapfrog through this. Start at the top left, work through the left page, go to the top left on the right page and work down. The guide number is going to tell you how to initially handle the event. Okay, so it tells you guide number 116, gases, flammable, unstable. Start with your potential hazards, fire or explosion, extremely flammable. Gives you your health hazards, and then goes to public safety, call 911, protective clothing, evacuation, immediate precautionary measures, large spill, fire. Jumping over to the right, emergency response, fire. Pay attention to the bold letters. Do not extinguish a leaking gas fire unless leak can be stopped. Small fire, large fire, fire involving tanks, spill or leak, ultimately first aid. You have to go each and every step through here. There are sometimes little itty bitty bullet points that completely change the scene for you. Make sure that you follow this exactly what it says. Again, the intent of this is for you to help isolate, mitigate, and separate the scene from the actual world, people, environment around you. It's time, distance, and separation for the hazmat team text to show up and make scene. And this is what you do to help take a bad event and keep it from getting a lot worse by just Kung Fu Panda rolling up there and start applying water when you shouldn't 
or you're not paying attention to the 500 other factors that need to be taken into consideration. This gives you the layout on how to handle that hazmat event. We're going to move into the green pages on page 286 for this book, and it's the introduction to the green tables. And probably one of the more important things to realize with this is, is they give you a really important definition here that you really need. The kicker with the green pages is I can argue that the green pages is where you do the actual most true productive work for that scene. And what it does is it helps you address the actual potentially safety hazard associated with whatever chemical you're dealing with and help you get established in an evacuation and safety zone. And a couple of things I have highlighted here is this table suggests distance is useful to protect people from vapors and gases resulting from spills. Okay? Provides first responders with initial guidance until technically qualified emergency response personnel are available. Okay? It's going to help you get an initial isolation zone and a protective action zone. All right? Kind of bounce down here to the bottom. We come into worst case scenario, terrorism, sabotage, and catastrophic accidents. One of the things that they really highlight here is when more than one large package is leaking and to consider a toxic inhalation hazard. So when you have, and it may not be terrorism, but when you start dealing with poisonous gases that are drifting in the wind, your containment area quadruples almost immediately. And you need to be prepared to take drastic increases in the actual protection of that area. Other factors that really need to be considered in this setup is certain atmospheric conditions. Is the gas settling in a valley in between tall buildings or generally being pushed in a river bottom? Okay, Daytime and nighttime Strong temperature swings greatly affect this. And generally, what season are you in? Do you have snow cover? Are you near sunset? Is temperature inversion a major problem? And ultimately, the, the, the physical atmospheric temperature, if it exceeds 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, the weather can greatly and dramatically affect these events. One thing to also be highly sensitive to with this is in the event that you ever get a spill at, near, on, around, or involving bodies of water. These events can turn into very significant hazards and ecological disasters really quick. Quite frankly, some of the chemicals out there are just bad. They're bad things, they're, they're full of bad, and they're going to kill everything they get in contact with. And you really just don't want to deal with that in a river, a lake, your water supply dropping down into an aquifer or a well. It's a real issue, and it's one of your primary concerns when you show up on scene. There's this, this green table introduction just gives a full way to how to handle these different events. The next thing we're going to bounce into is the physical green table. Okay? And one thing that I want to point out here is, and I want to make sure I'm on the right page first, and I am, is how to use the table. Okay, So you've got your initial isolation zone, and then ultimately your protective action zone. And one of the big things to realize is, is that as you go downwind, and we'll say in this case one mile, they also go a half a mile left and right to make a full one mile containment zone downwind. So it's your crosswind uh, containment zones and it's something to be really cognizant of when you're setting up for these, these possible big hazard events. Now let's talk about how to actually read this particular section here. One thing I want to highlight is you see how it says Table 1? This is where Table 1's at. There's a second section for Table 2, 
and table two is the extra terrible, extra horrible stuff. Okay, so we've gone through the guidebook. We noticed it was green. We took the initial setup and recommendations for establishing our zone in the guidebook, and now we have to follow up with our actual containment area and possible evacuation recommendations based off of this table. So if we come back here and we look at our guide number, okay, ID number, guide number, name and material, and it'll tell you where to fall at into all of this, okay? So when you pick a name of something and you've used, you use the reference guide number, come across small spills, large spills, okay? First isolate, then protect, day or night. Large spills, isolate, protect, day or night. And you need to follow this to, to, to their exact recommendation, okay? We'll just take the very first chemical that we can get that has a guide number, or correction, an ID number, okay? We're going to bounce into anhydrous ammonia. It's bad stuff right there. So our ID number is 1,005, the guide number is 125. We'll pretend that it's a small spill, okay? So first isolate 30 meters. We'll pretend that it's during the daytime. So for anhydrous ammonia during the daytime, we need to isolate the area basically one-tenth of a mile. So let's call it 200 yards. So here we are back with table one. We have anhydrous ammonia. Maybe our small spill has become a large spill. So we want to update. And all of a sudden we get to a section that refers to table three. Now in this particular case, table three is the very back of the guidebook. Okay. And the thing to make note of here is initial isolation and protective action distances for larger spills for different quantities of the six common toxic inhalation hazards. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and we're going to go find anhydrous ammonia. Okay. This is a broken down a lot more. It's got rail car, highway tank truck, agri agricultural nurse tank, multiple small cylinders. So let's go worst case scenario. Let's do a rail car. Okay. First isolate the 1,000 feet in any direction during the daytime, and it gets it's got different wind speeds that it tells you. So if you're on a high wind day, okay, greater than 20 knots, you need to immediately jump to a half a mile. And if it's at night, high speeds, you almost need to go to one mile. So for the extra bad, they'll throw this in here. Here's the one thing that the reason this special chart exists. All these chemicals that are listed here, uh, they're heavier than air. They're going to actually stay stuck to the ground. So they're going to be pushed along the ground. If it's lighter than air, the chemical's going to drift up. And it's not that it's not hazard, but it won't be staying stuck to the ground. Since we've covered Table 3, I'm going to back up and just show you Table 2 real quick. Table two, real quick, is water reactive materials that produce toxic gases. So originally, when we were talking about the guidebook saying reference table one or two, this is what they're talking about. All right. So we'll just pretend that we have something like the guide ID number 129, guide number 139, and I think that's trichloral saline. Okay and it gives off HCI. We come down here and we find out that HCI is hydrogen chloride. Well, I don't know what hydrogen chloride is, but it sounds terrible. And since this book is saying it's toxic, I have a sneaky feeling that it'll probably kill you right now. It's not something to be in the wrong PPE with. The kicker with this is, is that these are typically water reactive materials. So you're going to be releasing the gas as you're trying to put the fire out. 
Just a quick note on this real quick. If you go to page 354, this is the very back of the ERG book. It's the last group of white pages. It's just more of a user's guide. It's got a lot more information in it on how to use the book, and it also has how to handle weapons of mass destruction, terrorist events, suspic suspicion of criminal activity, and just de PPE, decon, fire and spill control, blevies, IEDs, and ultimately glossary. This part of the book can also help you utilize the full manual more appropriately. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through just a couple of examples here and just show you the basic use of it. So we've arrived on scene and we have an unknown hazardous material that with an ID placard of 1259. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the yellow pages and I'm going to go to 1259. Okay. And when I go through it, 1248, 1259. Okay. A couple of things are happening here. The first one, guide number 1250 or ID number 1259. We have a guide number of 131. The name is nickel carbonyl, and it's in green. So we've got to make sure that we follow up with the green section. But we're going to start by going with guide 131. So I'm going to jump over to guide 131. Okay. And it's a flammable liquid, toxic. My potential hazards, health, toxic may be fatal if inhaled, ingested, or absorbed through the skin. So this is already some pretty exciting stuff. Fire explosion, highly flammable, will be easily ignited by heat, sparks, or flames. Caution, okay. Methanol burn with an invisible flame. Use an alternative method of detection. Okay, public safety, PPE. I want to highlight the PPE here. Wear your self-contained breathing apparatus. Wear chemical protective clothing that is specifically recommended by the manufacturer when there is no fire risk. Structural firefighting PPE clothing provides thermal protection but only limited chemical protection. Basically, if it's on fire, you need to spray it from a distance and you don't damn near get close to it. Your evacuation, immediate precautionary, leak, precautionary measures for spills, and fires. Then it tells you your actual emergency response for fire. If it's small, you can dry chem, CO2, water spray, or alcohol resistant foam. A large fire, foam, fire involving tanks or trail car, uh, rail cars. Okay. Spill, small spill, large spill, first aid. The last thing we got to remember is, is that this was in green. So it was guide number 131. So we're going to go over here to the green section. And turn it sideways. All right. So it looks like we're going to have a hard time finding it that real quick. So what else can we possibly do? Well, maybe we can just look it up by its name real quick. Or, did we have that ID number originally? We did. What was it? 1259. Twelve fifty nine. Nickel carbonyl. Small spill, large spill. So first isolate 100 meters on a large spill of 1,000 meters. If it's during the day, a, a 0.8-mile per, uh, downwind protection, 3 miles at night for large events, 10 point, or 6.8 miles during the day, and 7-plus miles at night. So this is some pretty bad stuff. And this is why you need to pay close attention to what the guidebook tells you because we typically don't operate in miles. We don't think about trying to secure an area in those distances. And 
you don't need to know a single thing about the, the actual product to be able to be significantly hampered by the total distance in the area that you need to protect. All right, this next scenario I'm going to give you is, is that you've arrived on scene to a tractor trailer going down the road. The operator of the truck sees you coming up. He runs up to the engine, waving his arms. He screams the name that the truck is filled with boron trifluoride dimethyl etherate. And then he continues to run down the road. That is a really good indication that something is on there that's really bad. And I'd go ahead and just establish the old safety perimeter pretty much where you stopped. And if you need to, back up about 150, 300 feet. But regardless, you had someone write down the name boron trifluoride dimethyl etherate. And we don't have an ID number. So how do we find it? We go to the blue section. And we go find the boron. It'll probably take me 14 tries to get through it. Too far. There we go. So we have boron trifluoride, dihydrate, acetate, trifluoride acetate acid, boron trifluoride diethyl etherate. Is that the one? This is where it has to make sense, because this is diethyl, and unfortunately for you, they said dimethyl, okay? So you need to go to the boron trifluoride dimethyl etherate. And I realize that it seems like I'm splitting hairs, but if you look at the difference between the two, one is a toxic hazard atmosphere associated with it. So the difference in responses is truly gigantic. It gives you the guide number of 139, and hey, we finally have an ID number, 2965. So let's go to guide number 139. Okay, Sub substances, water reactive, emitting flammable and toxic gases. So this is some extra fun stuff. Once again, potential hazards, fire explosion, health, public safety, PPE, evacuations, spills and fires, emergency response for a fire. It really highlights do not use water or foam, small fire, large fire, fire involving tanks or rail cars, spills and leaks, do not get water on the spilled substance or inside containers. Four, good Lord, I can't even read that word. Chloral salines, do that. S small spill, powder spill, and again, do not clean up or dispose of except under supervision of a specialist. First aid. Now, we still got to remember that we specifically had a green section associated with this. So we need to go find our boron trifluoride dimethyl etherate over in the green section. Okay. Luckily, we actually wrote down our ID number for 26, 2965. So we're going to just go to 2965 real quick. Twenty-nine sixty-five. There's our guide number one thirty-nine. Boron trifluoride dimethyl etherate. When spilled in water, small spills, large spills. And that's how you use that book for this scenario. One last scenario to run through. You arrive on scene, and you find a placard with an ID number of 2480 on the placard. So you take your ERG, you open up to your ID guide pages, which is in yellow, you go to 2480, and suddenly we have a 155P and it's methyl isocyanates. 
Now the kicker here is that P. If you notice the guide number 155, but this one's 155P. What does that P stand for? Polymerization. The polymerization is exceedingly flammable, causing gigantic explosions. And, and the polymerization is a chemistry term for small molecules creating bigger molecules and releasing a gigantic amount of heat in the process. Polymerization chemicals have a tendency to cause big booms, and, and I do mean big. So we're going to start with the ID number, the 2480, guide number 155P, and the, the methyl isocyanates. So let's go to guide number 155. Now, there's no 155P, 156, 154, barely saw that one, 154. So you got to remember that this is a polymerization product. Okay, substances toxic and or corrosive, flammable, water sensitive. Potential hazards, flamer exposure, flamer explosion, highly flammable, will be easily ignited by heat, sparks, and flames. Health, toxic, and then more health stuff. Public safety, PPE, evacuations, spills and fires. Emergency response, fire, small fire, large fires, fires involving tanks and rail cars, spill and leaks, first aid. But we got to remember that we have to go to the actual green pages for this also. So let's go check out the ID number of 2480. So 2480, 155P, the methyl isocyanates. From small spill, isolate 150 meters, 500 feet. Daytime, 1.1 miles. Nighttime, 3.1 miles. If it is a large spill, 3,000 feet for the initial isolation zone. Daytime, 7 miles. Nighttime, 7 miles. And again, this is... This is some bad stuff right here. There are times when you won't have to go to the green section. All you would do is work around the orange section. I'm going to reference here in the, the yellow pages for looking up the ID number. You can see lots of chemicals here that don't require working in the green tables. Same for the blue. There's lots of chemicals in here that don't work in the green pages. So you will do all your reference and initial setup and isolation through the orange pages. The last thing I want to cover here is the practical side of the ERGs and being able to have access to them for when you know you might need them. And realistically, you or someone on the department's always going to have their cell phone. I really recommend putting the ERG app on your phone. It takes no space, it's handy, and quite frankly, it's very easy to use. The kicker with the ERG books is, is that you have all the information readily available to you. Technically, it's there in the app, but I have found historically that it's a little harder to find. But what I'm gonna do is just show you some basic usage and kind of how to go through it. So it's already got it lined out by search, by UN or name, search by image, your browsing, and a guide page, reference materials, and then ultimately something about this book. Okay, so we'll just start by up here by clicking. And I went ahead and entered just a couple of, of things that we were looking at. And I'm going to start with the nickel carbonyl first. Okay. It gives you a full breakdown of everything that you need there. Okay, 
The other nice thing about this is, is that it gives you the other green page information automatically. So you've got the full breakdown right there for you. The thing you kind of got to pay attention to, and it's sneaky, is if you remember on our 155P, the P's, it's kind of innocuous, and it's just sitting right there. But it gives you the full breakdown again. Here's the 155 up at the top, okay, and your full guide breakdown. Now, this is on an iPad, so it's a little easier to see, but you can use this on an iPad or on your phone, no problem. The thing I would really recommend you do is, is that, and, and I know it seems kind of redundant, but you need to be familiar with how to use both. What if your phone dies? What if you don't have access to your phone? What if you left it at the station? There's 500 what ifs, and you have the ERG on the truck, the physical hard copy of the book on the truck. You need to know how to use both. Outside of that, that's a quick run through of this class. I'm going to leave it there. If you have any questions, let us know. Also, let us know if this helps. Thanks again. This is Matt Holon with Granberry Volunteer Fire Department, signing out.